So that's pretty low. That, that's a pretty good number for heating. It's really low. But it's, very, it's a false positive reading because that's not accurate because I am not taking into consideration this coil or the filter. Now, I have put over here, since this is a testing facility, I have put a damper in here. So what I'm going to do is simulate some uh, shrunken return duct, high resistance in the return duct. So I wanted to show you what would happen if I turn this and I block some of the air off. Okay. I shut down some of the return air. So now we have the technician came out. He accessed in the wrong testing locations. He is on the plenum area. He is in the return air drop. And then he reads his meter. His meter says 0.50 inches of water column, which looks like a pretty good number. He comes over here to the name tag of the unit and says, that is normal. I am under or I'm right at the maximum level. So I have a good duct system. But that's not true. That is an actual false positive reading because he did not take into consideration the coil or the filter. That what looks like a good number right now, in essence, is a very bad number. It's a very high static pressure. If he was to actually put his probes in the correct location, and again, between the coil and the furnace, and between the filter and the furnace, you will see my actual static pressure is not. 0.24, 0.23. My actual ESP, external static pressure for this piece of equipment, is 0.69, almost 0.7 inches. So it's way higher than what the allowable level is. Now, when you have a piece of equipment like this, you know, keeping in mind that 0.5 is a cooling number. I'm running on continuous fan, which happens to be on this piece of equipment, the low heating speed. So when I went to cooling, I could very easily be running at one inches of static pressure. And as soon as that static pressure goes up, airflow is compromised. Think of it in the sense that, you know, airflow is directly proportionate to whatever the static pressure is. Higher the static pressure, the less airflow. The lower the static pressure, the more airflow. Now, a lot of guys will say to me, I, I understand that on a lot of applications, you know, you have a case coil sitting directly on top of the furnace. So, you know, although that's a testing area and I set it up so we can test that there is separation between the coil and the outlet of the furnace, I realize that is not always the case. A lot of times you will have a coil setting directly on top of the furnace. When you run into those cases, one good place to get the reading between the coil and the furnace is actually the back side of the furnace. A lot of times I can tap the back of the furnace up at the top area and I can actually get the probe and tap it in like this. So then the probe will actually sit here. And since I'm looking for pressure that's inside the cabinet, that actually works fairly well. You don't want to be on the sides because on the sides, there's typically baffles and they could run all the way up the side of the furnace. They are to keep the heat on the outside chambers of the heat exchanger. And they can give you some very you know, false readings that way. But as long as you stay close to the top and don't drill in really far, you can easily tap the back of the furnace like this and get your static probe in there, something like that getting familiar with checking pressure drops, static pressure, things like that. You can learn a lot about the system. One thing I wanted to show you real quick as we start winding down here is, you know, you can check your static pressure, your total static pressure, but you can also, since you have a couple holes here across the coil, you know, I can tell you what the pressure drop across the coil is too, and it's pretty easy to do. And again, I do it almost the same way. I take the two hoses off my meter. I attach my static probes. I zero the meter out by scrolling down, hitting enter. Do that one more time. Okay. So I take one of the probes, I stick it in between the furnace and the coil. And then the other probe is on the outlet of the coil. And I am reading a pressure drop across this coil of 0 0.12, 0 0.13 inches of water column. And then you can compare that to a lot of product data. I would say most coils run somewhere right around, depending if they're wet or dry, you know, when they're clean, they run around, you know, 1.5, uh, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, something like that, depending if they're wet or if they are dry. But you can compare that to product data. But when you start seeing really huge numbers, you know, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, there's a pretty good indication that that coil is probably plugged. And a good indication of that is always if you see a lot of bad filters, dirty wheels, uh, chances are the coil is probably dirty also. I can also take the same setup. And you have to be careful with filters. Filters can have a high pressure drop across them too. High brush, uh, pressure drop filters are typically never a good idea. Uh, we see that a lot because homeowners tend to go out and buy 
you know, filters they hear about on TV or something like that, and you can get a very high pressure drop across them. Some of them work to some degree, but very high restrictive filters are typically not a very good idea. And again, I take my two probes and I put one between the filter and the furnace, and the other one's across the filter. So I'm going to have one on this side of the filter, the inlet, and the other side of the filter where the inlet of the blower motor is. You can see my pressure drop for this filter is 0.17, you know, which, which is a little bit restrictive. But you know, you've got to watch these really high restrictive ones, especially the one-inch filters. You know, filters, filters like this that have a high value of picking up, but they're only one inch thick, it's very hard to get air through those filters. I mean, <clears throat> so those can be really bad and can be damaging to a system. Once you have your total static pressure, although you can evaluate your entire duct system by knowing the resistance value, you can also determine how much airflow you're actually getting. And that's actually a good number to know because, you know, a lot of guys, you know, they assume a certain amount. Just because it has a blower drive saying 800 CFM don't mean you get 800 CFM. Like I mentioned in the beginning, that only means you're getting that if you have the right static pressure. So one thing you can do, once you have your static pressure, you can go to the manufacturing specifications. And most manufacturers will give you a fan curve. It is air performance or air delivery based on static pressure. For this example, it looks something like this. I have this furnace right here, this 06012. That's the furnace we've been working on. It means it's 60,000 BTUs, and it means it is a 1,200 CFM drive, so a three-ton drive. So you can see this. It has my blower speeds right here, high, medium, high, medium, low, and low. Across the top is my static pressure, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So what I do is say I'm on high speed, I have this unit, I come straight across to 0.5, is 1200 CFM. Now, if my static pressure was actually moving up this way, and I had my static pressure was 0 0.8, I come all the way across here, now I got a unit that is operating with 935 CFM instead of 1200. And a lot of times, you'll see static pressure about one inch. That's clear off this chart. And when it becomes off the chart at 0.9, one inch, you might be moving 800 CFMs on a three-ton drive. So how well does an air conditioning unit operate off of 800 CFMs when it's a three-ton air conditioner? When you are done with your testing, I, I always recommend to all the guys, I mean, you want to put plugs back into all your holes. We're trying to be professionals. You don't want to be you know, covering things up with tape and caulking and things like that. You can buy plugs just about anywhere. Uh, and make sure all your holes are plugged back up. Make sure they are sealed so it is a quality testing, you know, and it's a quality job that is done. And I also recommend, you know, when you go out, you know, it's one of those measurements that should be taken all the time. When you look at the nameplate, if the manufacturer went through the effort of stamping it on that plate, it's pretty important to check. You should be checking the gas pressure, the temperature rise, the voltage, and doing a complete analysis on the efficiency, including combustion testing, so you know that the equipment is safe in operation and operating properly. Know that your CO is correct. Know that your O2 is correct and your combustion efficiency. I recommend that when you are done doing all that, you document all that, or if you're using something like the FireRite Pro with the printer, you can print that information off, staple it to a Ticket. So later down the road, when you leave there, everybody knows exactly how that piece of equipment was left and the operation it was in when you walked out the door. So for more information on airflow testing, static pressure, combustion chaining, uh, check with your local distributor and trading agencies.